Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ricardo Zanri, and I'm a Marine Program Manager with WWF. And I'm going to talk to you today about a career in ocean conservation. Um, I guess, uh, as the guess at this time of the, uh, this time, there's been never been a more important time to work on ocean conservation, given the range of serious threats our oceans are facing, um, from climate change, overfishing, and pollution. And I'm sure you've all seen um, the ocean and climate in the news recently. Um, we need everything from scientists, educators, filmmakers, project managers, sociologists, accountants, writers, fundraisers, and political influencers to help save the ocean. I think people often think that to work in conservation, you have to have a you have to be a biologist, but you will be surprised how few biologists uh, work at WWF, um, with most people coming from a whole range of backgrounds and skill sets to make conservation happen. I'm one of those people that doesn't have a biology background and have worked in marine conservation for more than 25 years, from field work protecting and gathering data on endangered species in Asia, right through to designing and managing marine projects in Hawaii. So uh, before I explain about my career journey, let me tell you a little bit about my current job. So I'm a marine program manager at WWF at UK, and I manage two programs in collaboration with Sky Ocean Rescue. Um, one involves the UK, Spain, Italy, and Germany. And the aim of this project is to make the management of marine protected areas they're more effective. And you can see in this map, the, um, the highlighted areas are marine protected areas across the UK and those countries I mentioned. And those are some of the, the protected areas that we're looking um, to improve the uh, effective management of these, these sites. Um, basically, it's, it, it's, it's the same as um, 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 making a marine park do their job at protecting uh, the marine life that exists within um, those marine parks. Um, and the second program that I work on is managing the UK's first seagrass restoration project, working with Swansea University to restore seagrass, where it's been lost around the UK. And we're restoring seagrass because it provides really important habitat to maintain the health and productivity of our seas and also help fight climate change. Um, and uh, seagrass is very important um, in providing a habitat for a whole range of different species, um, including a lot of the fish that we eat. So it's a very, very critical habitat. So what does my current job actually mean? Um, I do day to day. Um, well, I guess it's a bit of everything. Um, it's, it's what all managers do, expect to do. Um, I spend time in fundraising, planning and reporting on projects, doing awareness work as well as advocacy work. I have meetings with government as well as with local communities and partners where we do our work. And sometimes that might involve meeting famous people. And if you have a look on the picture on the right, you might have spot a, a famous sports star in that photo. Um, I also help implement the projects, which mean I can spend days underwater um, collecting the seagrass seeds. Um, it could mean that I'm, I'm on the ground having meetings with different people, um, whether it's fishermen or local community members. Um, and every day is basically very varied. Um, and if I have to think about the different skill sets that I have that, to help me do that job, um, it's really my project management skills, um, which actually came from a business related degree. Um, and it's, it's some of these skills that have helped me most in my conservation career, which as I always show you means you don't have to be a biologist to work in conservation. So to the start, um, well, I guess my interest and love for the natural world came first from a lot of time spent outdoors, playing outdoors, and also fishing as a kid. And as you see from these photos, I really did like fishing. Um, I was inquisitive, um, and so always wanted to know what things were and why they were like that, which meant that I read a lot and watched a lot of this guy, which I'm sure you will recognize as David Attenborough. Um, and, and by watching him, it only further increased my fascination about the natural world. Um, I was good at biology at school, but I was terrible at physics and chemistry, and my teachers at the time didn't recommend um, that I should do my A-levels in the sciences, as they didn't think I'd get the grades to go to university. So instead, I chose humanities subjects and thought, well, maybe a, a career out in the jungle tracking gorillas just wasn't going to be for me. Um, I ended up getting the school grades I needed to go to university and decided I would do a, uh, a tourism and hospitality management degree. Um, and the reason I, did, I chose that because I saw it as a way to get a job um, and be able to travel in the countries where tourists go to see these amazing natural environments in which I'd seen on, on the TV with David Attenborough. 
and, and in particular, I was really fascinated by the tropics. So once I got my degree, I um, saved enough money from holiday jobs to be able to take a year off and travel. Um, but not just travel, I wanted to taste what it would be like to really live and work in a tropical country, to immerse myself in alien culture. I also wanted to do something worthwhile to help both local people and the natural environment. So I decided um, I would, I would get, get something where I could travel around Asia, but also do some volunteer work as well. And I found a, a place at an Indian rural development project in the Himalayas for four months. This project in India was a sustainable community forest project, working with the local community to protect forests and farm in a way that doesn't damage the land. I live in a very remote community, hours walk from the nearest road, where there was no running water and no electricity, where life was very simple, but also rich in culture and in a very beautiful mountain environment, as you can see from these photos. I learned how to plow using a cow, just like in that photo on the top right, um, grow crops and herb gardens, and importantly for my career, I also learned um, how tough people's lives are in, in some of these countries, where, which are, are less better off than, than, than in the UK. Um, and I understood a little bit more about the day's struggles um, to provide for and educate um, people's families. Um, and, and as a result of those struggles, sometimes the environment would suffer. There's this understanding of the complexity of, of the human interaction with, with the natural environment that would later help me in my conservation career. Um, as to do good conservation work, we really need to work with local communities to understand their needs and concerns and also involve them in conservation projects. I'd also say that volunteer work is really important to building up your experience and skills in an area of work and employers look really favorably on this as it shows dedication and enthusiasm and provides important real world experiences that education institutions are less able to provide. My travels around India and Southeast Asia after that job just cemented for me that, to, that I wanted to work in the tropics and um, to, to spend as much time as possible in, in the natural wonders of the tropics. Um, so if I loved the, the natural world before, I was totally in love with it now. I knew that I wanted to live and, and work in such amazing places and help protect them. One highlight on that trip, uh, traveling around Asia, um, that later influenced my career was snorkeling for the first time on a coral reef and seeing this amazing new underwater world that literally had me going, oh, wow, down the snorkel. That left a huge mark on me and the ocean suddenly became a lot more interesting to me. So when I came back to the UK, I decided to do an environmental management master's degree to develop my environmental knowledge, building this onto the management training I already had for my first degree. My aim was to get a job on any kind of tropical conservation project. And I chose all my subjects for the master's degree to be tropical and ocean related wherever possible. And I chose ecotourism as a topic for my thesis, blending together my experience and knowledge from my first degree with that of my master's. As you probably know, ecotourism is a special kind of tourism that is designed carefully so as not to destroy the environment, minimizing disturbance um, when people visit the area, but also providing benefits to local people who, else, who also then help protect the environment. I think having some generalist knowledge on subjects such as project business management and the environment, and then the specialist knowledge in ecotourism, for example, helped me get job later on. If you really know what you want to do, then I strongly suggest specialist training in that subject area. If you're less sure of what you, what area of conservation environment related work you want to do, then um, I suggest a more generalist study that broadens your opportunities. And that'd be a good place to start until you find your particular area of interest. I should also say at this point that you can have just a big an impact in, on conservation and ocean conservation, working in a whole range of other job sectors, not just in uh, working for a charity like um, um, WWF. Um, and a lot of different sectors um, have, to, um, have an important impact on the natural world. And it's where if it's in these different sectors that you could also have an impact um, on the environment. Um, so it's not just about working with governments or charity sectors. Um, you could, for example, join the fishing industry and work to make fishing more sustainable. You could join a newspaper as a reporter on environmental issues to, to bring the issues to the public. Um, you could become a teacher in the sciences and help educate the next generation about the importance of, of nature and, um, and, um, and conservation. Or you could work in the food industry to promote sustainable sources of food. Um, the list of the options are endless. So when I graduated from university, my first job was in the UK environmental consultancy, a job I got because of my ecotourism specialist knowledge. 
And what I did was I helped to research and write advisory papers on ecotourism, and ecotourism is seen as support to conservation around the world. I took this job while I, I looked for that dream job abroad, um, which was proving not easy to find. I did, however, see um, lots of in volunteer positions abroad and thought, well, I may have to start there first to prove myself and earn a paid job. But then, of course, how to survive um, abroad while not having any pay? Um, well, I, what I decided to do was that I would do one more course, and that was to learn how to teach English abroad as, as, as a foreign language. I thought, well, I can earn money from teaching English, which would allow me to volunteer on nature projects until I could get a paid job. So I was in, in England for a year doing the consultancy job, learning how to teach English. And as luck would have it, at the end of my teaching course, I saw a note from the language school um, and on a notice board there about an English teaching position at a total conservation project in Sri Lanka, um, which also paid actually a little bit of money as well um, to be able to support myself to a small degree. I applied and got the position as the organization was also looking to develop ecotourism at the project. So that was a good coincidence because uh, I had experience in that area. And the reason they were doing that because they wanted local people um, to be able to um, earn a living um, from um, ecotourism um, rather than to um, kill endangered species like sea turtles for meat and eggs. Um, so th this was really helpful in, in my ecotourism experience um, in, in helping to get this particular job in the tropics. And um, you know, sometimes you also need a little bit of luck as well. Um, I went out to Sri Lanka knowing nothing about sea turtles, but I was determined to find a way to get a paid job on this project. Um, it was based in, in a remote area in the southeast of the country, a place called Rekwa. Um, again, no power running water there in a very hot and dry part of, of Sri Lanka. Um, can you imagine actually living um, and not having any electricity or running water for three years? It was, it was pretty tough, and especially in the, in the heat of that part of the country. Um, I spent part of my day teaching English to, to local school children, as well as to the community members who would be working with tourists. The other part of the day I spent helping to design uh, an ecotourism program for the project. And at night I would go out with the research scientists to the beach and learn everything I could about nesting sea turtles. Within a year, I was given a paid job as a turtle researcher and ecotourism project developer. And within two years, I was part of the project management team coordinating all the sea turtle research and protection work at the project, as well as operating the ecotourism program. <clears throat> After three years, um, um, I was working not just on um, sea turtle conservation, but we'd actually expanded the project to do conservation work um, for the, con the coastal habitats that sea turtles spend part of their time, is, time in, which is, includes the lagoons, mangroves, coral reefs, and beaches. I was learning a lot from both the scientists that I was working with, but also the local people who I learned had incredible knowledge about their environment and how it works. They knew things that the scientists didn't even know. This understanding would be helpful for me later in my career in getting jobs and designing successful projects using local knowledge. I was also doing a lot of reading and learning about marine science in my free time. The Cito Conservation Project in Sri Lanka was very advanced at that time, combining conservation of the species and their habitats with a program to improve local people's livelihoods and involve local people in the conservation and related businesses. So at the end of the three years, I had specialist knowledge that would help me get future jobs. And for the next seven years, I was able to get jobs in sea turtle conservation around the world. I had no special interest in sea turtles prior to that job in Sri Lanka, but that was where I landed. And it was a cool animal to work with, as it was an endangered species that has been on the planet for millions of years and that moves across the world's tropical oceans. So it ticked all the boxes for me. That flexibility and openness to find a way to do my dream career, but with a clear goal of wanting to do work in oceans and in the tropics had worked out for me. And I was now a sea turtle conservation specialist. Then in 1998, after three years living off the grid in a remote air, which at times was really difficult, um, I was, and with the project now in a, in a good position um, to be run by local people and, and needing, less, needing less support from, from people with outside expertise, I then decided to leave Sri Lanka. And over the next three year, two years, I worked at three turtle conservation projects in Latin America, interspersed with some adventurous travel. Um, I worked at two of the most famous turtle nesting beaches in the world. Um, the first was in the remote jungle of Tortuguero in Costa Rica, 
can see some amazing photos here of the canal system behind um, the ocean beaches where the turtles would come up. And this was a um, volcanic black sand beach, which was particularly difficult to work at nighttime, actually, because when it gets black and there's no white sand to reflect the light, um, you really can't see anything at all. And the other place I worked um, was a place called Escobilla in Mexico, which is famous for tens of thousands of turtles, sometimes nesting just over a few days, um, coming to nest. And you can see the images there of how many turtles are coming up to the beach. That's quite incredible. And the, the last one was um, a turtle project in a place called Celestun, also in Mexico, in the beautiful part of the Yucatan Peninsula, which is very famous for its flamingos. And it was at these projects that I really helped, I really started to develop my, my scientific knowledge of one particular species and its interaction with its habitat. I'm rewinding a bit. When I was actually working in Sri Lanka a few years prior, um, there were some people from Africa who reached out to me to get advice on, on doing a similar sea turtle conservation project in Kenya. And at the time I'd given them some advice um, and two years later, they found some funding um, and, um, and wrote to me again and asked me if I would come out and help them establish a project. Um, this, was, this was such an exciting opportunity for me because I'd never been to Africa before. This was a, a, a chance for me to implement everything I'd learned and design a project in, in a way that I thought would, would be best for conservation and local people. So um, for the next four years, um, I built up a marine conservation project in Kenya that started with the conservation of sea turtles um, that were nesting and foraging in the Watamu and Malindi area, which you can see um, circled in red on, on that map over on the left-hand side of the slide. Um, and which I but actually grew it into a project um, protecting coastal marine life along uh, a section of the central Kenyan coast but also protecting sea turtles throughout the country and even doing um, some work in, um, in Tanzania and um, Somalia as well, the south of Somalia. Um, what, we, what we did, we, we created actually as a first for sea turtles, we created the first um, sea turtle rehabilitation center to treat um, sick and injured sea turtles in Africa, as well as the world's biggest community-based bycatch release program. And this is where we worked with local fishermen to release sea turtles that were caught in fishing nets by accident and to release them safely without harm. This project is still running today and I'm still involved as an advisor. It now employs more than 20 people and runs a wide range of marine projects that work to protect endangered species, coral reefs, mangrove lagoons and beaches. But it also works with local people on concept awareness and to provide sustainable livelihoods in fishing, farming and tourism in a way that doesn't destroy the environment. And um, here you can, on the right hand side, you can see um, some mangrove restoration work we had. We had a nursery for growing mangrove seedlings and going out and planting them in with the, working with community members. At the end of um, my four years in Kenya, I had learned a lot about conservation. Um, a lot about conservation project development and had broadened my marine understanding beyond just sea turtles to the wider marine environment. I was also continuing to grow my environmental knowledge from time spent doing the field work, but also talking to local people and reading. And I suggest that don't underestimate how much you will learn on your job and from continued reading. It's always important to listen and learn from those you work with and be open to other ways of doing things. And this is something that I, I learned while working in unfamiliar countries in, in unfamiliar environments. After getting the Kenya project to a place where I thought it had a solid base to grow from and good local staff experience enough to continue the project work, I decided to leave but remain involved as a project advisor from afar. I was now looking for a new challenge and was interested in broadening my conservation experience and when I saw an advert for a WF job to develop and manage a new river de de dolphin project on the Cambodian Mekong River, I thought that sounded fascinating and a great opportunity to learn and about a new species and also about river conservation. To be honest, I didn't think I'd get the job as I didn't have any experience working in rivers, um, but to my surprise, I was hired and I was told it was my experience in developing and managing new projects that had got me the job, which goes to show it's, you shouldn't be put off by jobs that involve new things you have no experience of. 
you've got to look at your experience and see what skills you have that could help achieve the hiring organization's objectives. Um, and you need to sell those skills, skills in, in the interview. The, the rest of, of the, the practice of doing that job, you can actually learn on the job while doing a job. I learned a lot about rivers over the next three years and ended up growing the river dolphin conservation project into a larger whole river conservation project for a 180 kilometer section of the northern Cambodian Mekong and it's that area in the oblong um, in, in the top left um, corner of the map there. Um, I was now running a program with a number of different community um, members. Um, I was involved in um, designing and implementing research programs on different species. I was doing education programs and also putting in place um, nature protection and patrol projects as well, working with local government. Included projects to protect a whole range of different um, endangered river species, um, birds and reptile species, as well as um, fishery development projects to help fishermen and even rural development projects to help farmers. I was learning more and more about how to work with local people to do conservation work. And this would be important for future jobs as the conservation world was realizing that you need to work with people if we're going to save the planet. After three years in Cambodia and having established WF's Cambodia Mekong Conservation Program, I was missing the ocean too much and wanted to go back to a job working in marine conservation. And so when I saw a job come up managing a marine protected area in Gabon in West Africa in a place called Mayumba, it's right down the south of Gabon there, you can see on the map, um, right on the border with um, the Congo, a very, very remote part of the world. And it has a very famous beach there um, in Mayumba, which is, um, is known to be the most important nesting beach for the world's largest sea turtle, the leatherback. And you can see a picture in the center of that slide there. Um, and these, these turtles can grow to several hundred kilos and can meters in length. Um, the area was super remote, wild and beautiful, um, with lots of big game animals um, roaming around close to the beaches. You'd even see surfing hippos in the ocean there. Um, very few people living there, um, very little infrastructure. And in this slide um, on the top right, you can actually see the view from my garden um, going straight out to the ocean there. Um, and so you can see um, when I was out on patrol, um, you could see the kind of remote areas that I was camping out um, near to the Congo border. And um, getting around there was super difficult. Um, in this slide here, you can, you can see that some of the public transport that we had to use, um, and this was a, a, a truck that I used to have to take, which was equivalent to basically to the local bus to get from um, Mayumba into the Congo. Um, it was a really tough place to live, but also amazingly wild and beautiful. And while out on patrol, I'd often come across, you know, massive python, um, massive pythons, bull elephants on the beach, even leopards and gorillas. And um, if you look at those top two left pictures, that huge python and that bull elephant, I actually met those while walking uh, along um, the beach. And um, those are photos that I took. Um, so, you know, very, very wild. And then when you go out into the ocean, out on, on boat patrol, I'd see humpback whales, um, schools of hundreds of dolphins, as you can see in that bottom left picture there, those are pictures of spinner dolphins. Um, and um, in the bottom right um, hand corner, there's a photo there of, of me feeding a baby West African manatee. It's one of the world's most endangered animals that I found washed up on the beach there in Mayumba. So a whole range of really exciting, cool um, animals that I learned more about while working there. Um, I basically, at the, at the end of the year, I'd learned how to manage a marine and land park, um, how to manage with lots of difficulties and lack of resources, and also how to deal with illegal fishers and hunters as well. So after a year working there, um, my wife got a scholarship to do a PhD in Hawaii. And so we thought, well, that's too good an opportunity to miss. Um, we'd never been out to Hawaii before, so we packed our bags and flew across the world to Hawaii, the world's most remote island. Um, they are nearly six hours flight from any, the nearest mainland. So you can see how remote they are right out in the middle of the Pacific. And um, yeah, that's me, the picture that you probably noticed by now, the, the guy with the shaved head um, out on the job. Um, and um, the, the kind of work that I was doing there, um, it, at first of all, it was really difficult. Um, I had a real struggle to find work um, as it's not easy to get a conservation job as a foreigner. 
in Hawaii. Um, there aren't many jobs available, and those that are, you can imagine, there's a huge queue of people that want to go and live out there and work there because it's such a beautiful place. And usually, Americans are ahead of me. Um, so, consequently, when I, was, when I was looking for jobs for the first year, I worked as a diver. Um, I'm a trained scuba diver to a level that allows me to be able to guide and help other divers. And so I did that for tourists coming to Hawaii. Um, this was a lot of fun. Um, these are photos um, I took um, while diving down on a, a World War II wreck, actually, um, off the coast of Hawaii, um, down at about 100 feet. Um, and you can see it's a very, very beautiful environment, lots of really cool animals. And the picture on the right there is actually the mast of, of the ship um, going up towards the, uh, the surface of the water. You see all the different kinds of corals and sponges attached to it. Um, so after a year of, of doing that work, I got really lucky um, with a job application and um, with, with, a large, with a large conservation project. And I got a job as a marine program manager. Um, and I think it was my experience of working with communities in Kenya and Cambodia that helped me get this job as a project involved working with traditional Hawaiian um, fishing communities um, to help protect the ocean um, and the land behind the ocean as well. Um, this, this job spanned across the Hawaiian islands. And so I was lucky to be going to new places that many tourists would never see. And here I learned about local cultures and other sustainable ways to manage the natural resources. Um, and I also learned about working with government as well, which would help me get my next job, um, working for WWF. In this photo here, you can see um, I'm working with some communities on, on the top left to rebuild a fish pond uh, wall. And on the right, um, using traditional fishing methods on throw nets to, to, to go and um, catch fish. Um, I think um, what, has what, what has helped me get new and interesting jobs um, throughout my career has been my curiosity uh, and willingness to try something new and learn as much as I can doing it. And I suppose to my employers, I had demonstrated adaptability um, working in different environments and cultures around the world. Um, in that way, I was building up my range of experiences such that when I started out my career as a specialist in sea turtle conservation, I have ended up being a generalist with a wide range of experiences in conservation project management, which I think can be applied to any job. So for example, my current job involves managing a seagrass project and I had never worked on seagrass before coming back to England. So the question I always um, get after people learn about the different places I've worked is, uh, why did you um, leave Hawaii and, and come back to grey old England? Well, I think one of the reasons was Trump. Um, and look what that got me. I got Boris instead. Um, and another reason was that after almost 25 years away, I wanted to spend more time with family and friends back in, in Europe. Um, working internationally does have its downsides. Um, and one of those is being away from family and friends. But um, looking back at some of the photos to make this presentation, I wouldn't have had it anyway. Um, after all, who doesn't want to swim with a manta or eat fried tarantulas? Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, I've got some questions come in now. I'm going to try and answer these. Um, the first question. Um, do I eat seafood? And is that okay um, if you want to protect ocean ecosystems? Um, You've got to be very careful with, with seafood um, as there are a number of different um, products that you can find now in the supermarkets, which unfortunately are not sustainable. And some of those species are right on the brink of extinction. And um, there's a big, big problem out in the ocean right now. Um, I think it's important to do your research um, about what um, different species are sustainable and it is okay to eat. And there, there are definitely options out there. 
Um, and there's a whole range of them from um, shellfish um, right through to fish species as well. Um, and so um, I, I do recommend that, that you do have a look um, out there for the recommendations on, on what species that you can eat and not have a negative impact on your environment. Um, the question I've got is, what's the most amazing experience you have had as a result of working in ocean conservation? Most amazing experience? Um, that's a good question. I, there's, there've been quite a few. Um, I would say probably my most amazing experience is working um, for a short period of time um, and visiting one of the most um, one of the most one of the most biodiverse um, reefs in the world in Indonesia, where there was incredible biodiversity and just when. When I put my head under the water there, I was just I was just shocked at how incredible it was. Um, it really opened my eyes as to what um, the world would have looked like at many of the wild places across the, the planet um, before we, we started destroying it. And that was that was an incredible experience. Um, and what's the biggest positive change you've helped happen? Um, I think my most satisfying um, achievement is probably less um, about the changes I've actually brought to bear in the natural environment. And um, there's been some incredible things um, that, that I've seen change as a result of conservation projects, um, um, which was really heartening in terms of species coming back from the brink in terms of um, better protection of, of natural habitats, which, were, which was very uh, rewarding um, to see. Um, but I think my, my, the biggest achievement uh, I consider my career is actually um, is building the knowledge of others um, who, um, who then have gone on to have successful careers in conservation, especially the knowledge of, of local people in countries where there were few opportunities to get an education. Um, and there's one particular person I can think of in, in Kenya um, who uh, I originally um, came to me and had a job um, helping uh, as, as a cleaner of the office actually and, and, and a cook for the project team um, but through their interest in conservation and, and time spent out um, with me out in the field they showed a very strong interest in the conservation work we were doing and um, I trained them and taught them over, over a few years and um, by the second year they, they had a job with the project and since then, that person has gone on to university and um, now has a research position, coordinator at, at, the, at the project, and has also won an award um, for um, one of the top conservationists in the year of the year for Africa. Um, that was ten years ago. So um, yeah, I, th I, th I would say that was that was the biggest, the most positive change because you know you then know that that person is going to go on and continue the good work and and spread the and spread the the. Um, the news about the importance of conservation to people that they know, their friends and colleagues, their community, and um, can go on and do good work um, for many, 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 many years beyond when I was, um, beyond the time I was there. Um, how do you find opportunities for volunteering and conservation in other countries? Um, there's a whole range of um, different websites you can go to. Um, I, I, if you type in volunteering, conservation, a whole load of them will come up. Um, some of those um, organizations are UK organizations that um, help to, to find positions for you in, um, in, in countries around the world. Um, and other organizations are organizations which just are basic advertising um, positions and skill sets that they need help on with um, online. And, and you can go out and, um, and work those countries, uh, in those countries for those projects. So um, yeah, just do have a look on the internet, just type in conservation you'll see a whole load of them how do you know um, they are good projects before you get out there um, you you have to do a lot of research um, I would suggest um, doing research on on the projects look at their track records if you can speak to um, find people that have worked on them previously and chat to them um, and another question there says do you need languages um, it is very helpful to have language skills obviously and 
that that may be helpful in in for example um, West African French speaking countries if you if you speak like some French but obviously um, you know you may not be expected to to understand Khmer which is the language of Cambodia um, coming from the UK and you'll usually find and this is the way that I've worked I've worked with um, local people who have a good command of English and their language um, and um, worked through translators while I've slowly built up my knowledge of the language to be able to interact myself with um, local community members and government people. Um, right, that seems to be all the questions I've got so far. Um, any more questions? Okay, so there's another question here just coming in. Um, this shows that it is really all about passion, skills, and experience, and using skills from one area to move on to the next. I completely agree. Um, what are the qualities that you would look for in a young person just wanting to start out in conservation work? I think, as you say, you know, the, the passion is 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 critical. Um, you know, I, 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 the interviews is really important to to demonstrate that. And I think that's where it goes back to what I said earlier on is about um, demonstration of, of time volunteering um, out in the natural world to show, to demonstrate that passion. But also um, that would, as I said, mentioned earlier on, it's, it's by that real world experience that you really develop the skills sets of, of practically what needs to happen um, in order for you to be able to make a positive contribution to conservation. And um, I think that's really important. Um, Another question here, are there jobs to help oceans worldwide that you could do without traveling around the world? Um, absolutely. Um, you know, it, looking at my, my job right now, um, I don't travel around the world. Um, I'm UK based um, and um, there's, I'm doing a lot of, a lot of work um, with other European countries to help um, conservation in those countries. Um, and um, there are a lot of positions I'm working for, especially large and non, non large non government organizations or charities, or even with government actually, where you could um, work as an advisor to um, for for those organizations to improve um, conservation in countries further afield. Um, you don't always have to be out working in those countries. There's a lot of um, support that. Um, um, people working in this country's need in terms of training on awareness, research, etc. So, yeah, you, you, you can be based in the UK and not have to travel long distances. Okay, um, if, looks like we're coming to the end now. If there are no other questions, I am going to sign off and um, hand over to the next speaker. Thank you everyone for your time and wish you all well.